Our fifth lecture in handout church history deals with the third and fourth centuries, Nicaea and the deity of Christ. First, the Bible teaches the deity of Christ. It's a rather sad fact that it's taught in the Old Testament to the Jews, but the Jews didn't believe it, and is taught in the New Testament to the Christians, and the Christians don't believe it. I think you all know the Jews at the coming of Christ were offended by his claim to deity, and that that may have been the principal reason for his crucifixion. Certainly it was the ground for his rejection, even though he had been predicted as the everlasting Father whose coming forth was from of old, and so on. But the fact remains that when he came as the divine Son, it was the occasion for his rejection. Well, I think we all know that our Jewish friends, unless they are converted to Christianity, still continue disbelieving the deity of Christ. It may be surprising to hear from me that the Christians disbelieve it too, but the evidence is in that most of the people who call themselves Christians today do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. The majority of Christians are liberal, and as liberal, they do not believe. Now, it's more noticeable in Europe than it is in the United States, where we have more conservatism than any other large nation in the world. But nevertheless, the fact remains that most people who today call themselves Christians do not believe in Christ as the Son of God. And surely, if He is divine, that's incomparably the most important thing about Him. And no matter how much you respect Jesus of Nazareth as a doer of good and a friend of sinners and an influence for civilization, if He's divine, that's an insult to uh, Him. But that seems to be the lay of the ground. And it's hard to interpret Christ's own words when he returns, will he find faith in the earth as implying anything other than that it will not change drastically before he comes. Number two, the Christian church was founded on Christ. Those who believed in him met together to worship Christ. It's not surprising that people outside the church don't worship Christ. We're not going to accept lying down that this man was God. But if a person ever became persuaded that Christ was the Son of God, there would be no option except to uh, worship him. And the church, therefore, by definition, is a body of people who worship Jesus Christ along with their uh, children. And manifestly, if they don't worship Christ, they are not a part of the church. And yet, they constitute the majority of those who are considered members of the church in our own day. Number three, so where Christ was, there was the church. Uh, I think it's worthy of noticing here that the word Christian equals worshiper of Christ. Uh, the Mohammedan, or Muhammadan, is is not a worshiper of Muhammad. They don't even like to be called Mohammedans. They're Muslims who submit to Allah, but their doctrine is there's one God, Allah, and his prophet is Muhammad. But they make it a point that they don't worship Muhammad, and they don't want other people to make the mistake of thinking 
They did. Now here's an interesting thing. The Muhammad, if Jesus Christ is God and should be worshipped, then Muhammad is a false prophet. And the Muslims have no right to their religion at all. Because strictly speaking, if Jesus Christ is God and Muhammad denies he's God, as Muhammad does, Muhammad is a false prophet. So that even this caveat which the Muslims make that they don't want to be called worshipers of God, I mean worshipers of Muhammad, but worshipers of Allah alone, and regarding Muhammad merely as his prophet, they are not worshiping the true Allah, because the true Allah is triune, and Muhammad, by denying that, and specifically denying the deity of Jesus Christ, is not even a true prophet. I hope you realize this. Uh, we have people today who call themselves Christians who act as if this is a legitimate religion. But it isn't. If Christianity be true, this has to be false. Oh, it may be legitimate in the sense that this is a free world and people may believe whatever they please. And we may respect their right to exist even while they're going on their way to perdition. But what I'm laboring here is that if a person is a true Christian, he cannot regard Islam as anything other than a false religion. I don't have to tell you there's a great deal of synthesis going on at the present time and misinterpretation of respect for other religions' right to exist in distinction from their evil in existing. I repeat, to be a Christian is to be a worshiper of Christ. And if that is a proper religion, this is an absolutely illegitimate, false religion that is t sweeping millions of people to perdition in its opposition to the deity of Jesus Christ. Number four, but just as there was a Judas among the apostles, there were antichrists in the church from its beginnings according to 1 John 4, 1. Many antichrists. There was a particular antichrist to be revealed, but there were many uh, antichrists in the church from the beginning. In the apostle in itself, there was an apostate, a person who ought never to have uh, been there. Well, I didn't mention this before, but when the church actually began with Eve as the first believer, the first child was an apostate. Cain was always an enemy of believers and a destroyer of true, uh, uh, true Christians. But right out of the family of God, so here, right out of the newly established Christian church is an apostate in the uh, apostolate and also many Antichrist within the Christian uh, communion. Number five, those who later openly denied the deity of Christ and almost took over the Christian church were called Arians after Arius, the presbyter of, Alexan of Bishop Alexander of Alexandria. But it was Origen who died in 254, who apparently loved and worshipped Christ, who nevertheless may have led Israel to sin by seeming to deny his full deity. The origin represents a very interesting type of uh, person with whom we'll become familiar throughout the history of the church. He was never canonized, though he was the greatest scholar of the early church, and in most people's book, one of the greatest Christians in the early church. And yet what I'm saying here now is probably true. It's not absolutely certain that it was this good man who gave birth to the bad man, Arius. Origen seems to have led to Arius. It was through the study of Origen and that type of Antiochian tradition that Arius came to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. There's no question that Arius called Christ a catissus, a creature. 
Now, if he's the Son of God, he is not a creature. He's actually one with the uh, Creator. There's no way of interpreting Arius any other way, though he was, as I say, he was a presbyter in the church in uh, Alexandria. He was regarded as a uh, Christian. He was a powerful influence in the Christian church, a powerful influence uh, for evil. And as I say, there's no way of interpreting him any other way. But Origen, on the other hand, preceding period, undoubtedly a godly man. I personally find it impossible to believe that he worshiped Jesus. And yet it's his teaching that led to this. In his interpretation, for example, of John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, Lagos. The Lagos was with God, and the Lagos was God. The Word was God. He takes the Lagos to be subordinate. The Lagos, a clear reference to Jesus Christ, of course, later incarnate. The Lagos was subordinate to the Father. And actually seems to have been brought into being by God. See, this is the problem here. Is Origen interpreting those words of the inspired gospel according to John? He certainly means that Christ is subordinate to God. But is he inferior to God? Well, he doesn't only use the term subordinate, but he indicates that God brought him into being. You could see how Arius might get from that that Christ was a creature. And yet, the term eternally begotten originates out of these circles. Now, if Jesus Christ is eternally begotten, then manifestly he's no creature. A creature, by definition, is temporally begotten. He brought into being in time. If the Lagos was brought into being in an unimaginably ancient period, it would make no difference. He'd still be a creature. But if he's eternally begotten, I'm one of those who considers that a classic formulation of Christological orthodoxy. There are other people who would challenge that, but they can't challenge the fact that if Origen meant that the Lagos was eternally produced by God, that would be pure orthodoxy. And Arius would never have called Origen father. All we can say, because this is very, very difficult territory, and there's anything but unanimity among Origen scholars, all we can say is, at best, Origen was ambiguous on this, and there is no question that the Antiochians tended away from a high view of uh, Christological thought, and Arius claimed that type of thing. Now, if that be in any way, as it seems to have been in some way, traceable to origin, we have the illustration of a good man who was a source of a great deal of evil. This is a phenomenon we're going to meet in the history of the church constantly. Here was a bad man. This man had no right to be in the Christian church. And the energies of his being were devoted to an attack on, de on the deity of Jesus Christ. He is not a legitimate member of the church, not to mention an officer of the church, not to mention an influence in the church. But on the other hand, here's a good man who seemed to have given birth to him, and so on, to have been to the source of it. It's a warning to all of us, I think, that we have to recognize that the best of Christians are faulty. And they can be quite unreliable. Our tendency is, of course, to hate our enemies and love our friends and to maintain that our friends can do no wrong and our enemies can do no right. Our Lord warns us against that kind of attitude. Origen seems to have been a good man on whom we should be on our, with respect to whom we should be on our, our guard. And he may have been the source of a great deal of Christological deviation without the slightest intention and in spite of the fact that he was a true and wonderful lover of Jesus Christ in his full uh, deity. Number six, 
Whatever question there may be about Origen's teaching and intention, there can be no question about Arius's teaching and intention. Number seven, Emperor Constantius showed that the son of a godly father, Emperor Constantine, who you remember uh, first made Christianity legal, he didn't establish Christianity in the Roman Empire, but he adopted it himself and he made it legal and he favored it, and he's the one who convened the council at Nicaea and so on. He was basically a godly man. So getting back to my reading of item number seven, Emperor Constantius showed that the son of a godly father, which he was, Emperor Constantine, could become an Arian and an Antichrist, though it must be admitted that his father had been more tolerant of Arians than Athanasius approved. See, the scene gets rather complicated here, and uh, that's the way it actually uh, was. That's the way the cookie crumbles. I can't make it plainer just because I'd like to be able to give you a, a simpler account. Constantine himself, the emperor, was basically a godly man who promoted the cause of Jesus Christ, but at the same time, though he was Athanasian and favored that Jesus Christ was fully God, he tolerated the Arians more than he ought to have done. So here again, you have an origin, a good man, who seems to have deviated from the path of rectitude slightly. Here's a good emperor who is more tolerant of evil than he actually uh, should have been. And along comes his son, who actually seems to favor Arianism. He certainly, as far as an emperor, imperial role was concerned, defended it and promoted it far more than his father, who was opposed to it, though too tolerant of it, and so on. Now here again we learn something. This man was a godly man who gave birth to an ungodly uh, son. Now Origen had no genealogical relationship to Arius, but he seems to have had a theological relationship. He didn't exactly father Arius, but it looks as if his type of thinking was what Arius took as a cue to his heretical type of, uh, of thinking. I labor this point here because it becomes evident in the church at the very beginning. I'm very fond of pointing out Peter as the author repeatedly of the statement, not so, Lord. Now, you normally you think that's a definition of a non-Christian. To say, not so, Lord. It's idiocy, for one thing. If it's the Lord, it's so. And what he says, you do. And the last thing in the world that would cross your mind was to say, not so, Lord. And yet Peter was doing it all the time, and there was no question. Peter was a lover of his Lord. But it's just a reminder of the fact, Peter is a forerunner of all of us, but it shows how, in the history of the church, Constantine can say, not so, Lord. And Origen can say, not so, Lord. And even Athanasius, the great champion of orthodoxy, had his uh, failings uh, as, uh, as well. Number eight, not being for Christ, Constantius and others turned against Christ and his great advocate, Athanasius, successor of Alexander as Bishop of Alexandria. Here again, uh, we, no we notice something. Our Lord had said, he who is not for me is against me. I'm sure you know people, I know people in the 20th century who are now against Christ, but it started, but they're not being for him. I think of one man in particular in high office right now, and I'd known him very, very well. I could see the time when he should have stood, and he didn't stand. And now he's standing where I don't think he wants to stand. It's almost against his will that he has, because he was not for Christ, finds himself against Christ. Now this is happening, uh, this is happening here, you see, repeatedly, that uh, 
people are, because they won't take the stance at Nicaea for the deity of Jesus Christ, homo usias, and so on, they tolerate and ultimately endorse Arianism and almost as a final step become against Athanasius. Athanasius is the one who stood firm from the beginning on this matter of Christological orthodoxy. Against Arius, Jesus Christ was very God of very God. And he was not produced and was in no sense a creature. Because of the vacillation over here, Athanasius was exiled constantly from his uh, bishopric, which reminds me of another detail. We're in the fourth century now, and you've got a bishopric, which ought never to have existed. There was never such an order as that in the Bible. The episkopos, or bishop, was equated with the presbyteros, or presbyter, or elder. But with the passage of centuries and the growth of uh, Christianity, certain churches become more eminent, and certain figures become more powerful, and first thing you know, they are endorsing a bad development with a biblical name, and they're doing good. The Alexander was the original champion of Christological orthodoxy. The bishop who succeeded him in an office that ought not to have existed was an even greater champion of orthodoxy. The picture's getting very, very mixed. Arius was the one who had the proper office. As I say, Arius was a presbyter, which was the biblical office, and yet he was the scoundrel. These people were having illegitimate offices, and yet they were the heroes of the faith. You got a, uh, uh, you've got a confused picture in one sense, but it's very plain and easy to follow in another sense. Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ is God. That, that's the all-important thing. But here's a man holding the right office who's taking the wrong stance on that. Here's a council which is taking the right stance, but with a great deal of opposition within it. Here's a man who's standing for the truth and suffering for the truth and champion par excellence of the full deity of Jesus Christ, but there he is in an illegitimate office. Another point of uh, tribute to Athanasius is this. The battle word in the Council of Nicaea, 325, concerning Christ was that he was homo usias, same essence as God. The term against that, which in A.D. 3, 325 was carrying the heretical message, was homoi usias. As Carlyle noticed, just a difference in a, a diphthong. He was of like essence. Now, Athanasius went to the mat. He was ready to be exiled or martyred, as the case may be, with the absolute insistence of the indispensable doctrine of the Christian religion, that Jesus Christ is of the very same essence as God, not even like him in the highest possible praise, more like him than any other being that ever existed or ever would exist. It's infinitely short of the mark. And Athanasius, more than anybody else, was a champion of that indispensable saving doctrine. Now, what I was going to mention is that with the passage of the century, the uh, debate continued, even though it was theoretically settled at Nicaea, and the problem that some people had with this term of orthodoxy was that it didn't bring out the difference between the Son and the Father. It was excellent for pointing out his identity and his full deity to say he was homa usias, of the same essence or substance as the Father, but it seemed to be almost uh, anti-Trinitarian. It seemed to do no justice at all to the way in which he was different from the Father, and an odd thing took place at the course of passage of the century and the involvement of the three Cappadocians I don't have time to mention here, and so on, in order to introduce to the orthodox doctrine of the person of Christ the way in which and the fact that he differed from the Father, 
The very word homoousios was reintroduced and reaffirmed. And at the end of the century, at Constantinople, the Council of Constantinople, this is the term for orthodoxy, and Athanasius is cheering for it. As I say, it's a tribute to uh, Athanasius that he wasn't fighting just for a word. He was fighting for a doctrine. And as long as this word meant that Christ was only like God and not God, he, of course, opposed it vigorously. As soon as it became clear that they were definitely holding firmly to this doctrine and using this term, which had previously been so obnoxious, as uh, meaning all this, plus indicating the fact that Christ in his deity was other than, as a person, the Father and the Holy Spirit. I should mention in this connection that the Second Council, con uh, the one at Constantinople at the end of the century, affirmed the deity of the Holy Spirit also against the Pneumatomachians. There were those Pneumatomachians. There were those who were orthodox enough about the person of Jesus Christ. He was very God, a very God. But there were those at the end of the fourth century who were still feeling the Spirit was just a, an aspect or a manifestation of the Father and the Son, not a person himself. And they were called Pneumatomachians, those who fought against the Spirit, not uh, in the sense that they fought against him as the third person in the Godhead. As to the glory of the First Council of Constantinople, that it affirmed really the, the Trinity. This, this would be the first adequate definition of the Trinity. Jesus Christ is very God of very God, but he is at the same time personally other than the Father, and the Holy Spirit is equally God and is likewise a member of the divine Trinity. And as I said, Athanasius watched that development, and though it called for the sacrifice of a term for which he had been sacrificing himself, he could see a real change, and he wasn't making anybody an offender for a word, only for a truth, and he was perfectly happy with the position of the church at the end of the uh, century. My time is up, uh, but it's a good place to stop anyway with the glorification. For the first time, creedally and officially, in a council of the whole church, the full deity of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.